Welcome to Saving Europe. I'm the novelist and historian Henry Viner Brooks, and in this series, we're following the lives and travels of two of history's unsung heroes. The decisive leadership shown by the 6th century monk Columbanus and the 20th century statesman Robert Schumann helped rescue Western civilization in two very different dark ages. So, joined by my two sons, I'm on a 4,000 mile, 12 country, post Brexit odyssey to find out if these men and these dark ages can teach us anything for today. In this episode, we have one more colossal treat in store, and that is an exclusive tour with Dr. Philip Lenz of the Irish Manuscript Collection at the San Gallen Library, which houses one of Europe's finest collections of medieval documents. And after that, in episode 13, we'll cross the Alps into Italy. Yeah, the way that Columbanus came, a beautiful plateau. We will sniff out almost forgotten locations associated with Columbanus, and finally arrive in Lombardy to meet another remarkable Dark Age queen, a very extraordinary woman called Theodolinda, where it turns out that Columbanus has something she needs. So, at the cathedral she built, we'll also sample Columbanus' literary legacy before heading further south. If you're finding this content helpful, then please return the favour by liking this video, subscribing to the channel, and perhaps even sharing it with a friend. And also, do check out the new book which accompanies this series. Thanks for watching. coming off the autobahn at St. Gallen. St. Gallen. This originally was just the hermitage of Gaul. Interestingly, some have argued that Gaul actually was not an Irishman, that he actually was from Alsace because of his language abilities here. Apparently he preached just behind us on Lake Constance in Brigance or Brigantium. And he preached in their own language. Gaul stayed here. I've never been to St. Gallen, so I'm quite interested. We had a lovely time at, uh, on the, what's it called, Wallensee, swimming on the laundry. Just coming to film here to really sort of pay a bit of homage to a very, very great man. He's one of those number two guys, one of those uh, person that plays the second fiddle well. And because of that, he must have gained somehow by some uh, heavenly economics, he gained a great standing and he had an enormous impact here. So, yeah. And this is the city that grew up around his hermitage. So Gaul is remembered here. And we want to remember him too. Um, they've got an interesting exhibition on the Irish manuscripts. I did email them, but I did not hear anything, so we'll go and see. We'll go and see. So we're here in the town of St. Gallen, and we're in search of that guy there. Columbanus is number two, lifelong Anamchara, trained at Bangor in Ireland, finally finishing here in his hermitage. And we're gonna to go to the museum now that was established in the monastery and the cathedral, uh, which became famous and is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. This library, this cathedral and the library attached to it became one of the most important libraries in all of Europe. Many Irish came here. And also, it has one of the great treasures of Switzerland. It has a plan of the ideal monastic community done in a, an infographic way so that it's all cramped together but showing the essential components. That's the first architectural plan on vellum ever to survive. Extraordinary. If you like Baroque, you're gonna love it here. Amazing having sort of read about so long and seen pictures. I feel like the Queen of Sheba before Solomon, the half has not yet been told. Can't help feeling that Gaul and Columbanus would not agree with this lavish detail. Not quite in the spirit of the greatly aesthetic Irish. It's hard not to be overawed by the power and the sheer 
lavishness of the detail, even though it's not my favourite style. Some plasterer made a good, good living here. But our quest today is to get to the library and have a look at some of the manuscripts. So we are incredibly privileged to be in one of the most important libraries in Europe. Yes, this Bibliothek of St. Gallen is one of the most important um, place where Irish manuscripts are preserved. Served in here, uh, this year's exposition is devoted to Irish book culture and to Irish history. And um, we uh, can just start here, okay. um, for instance, with the famous Irish Gospels of St. Gaul. Um, so that's number 51 of our medieval manuscripts and it's one of the most beautiful books that we possess. It was um, written and also illuminated as you may see yeah. probably in Ireland um, in the second half of the 8th century. Yes, I've got 780 on here. So uh, we're looking at uh, this is a, the golden age for Irish manuscript production and did they so we have Irishmen coming to St. Gallen or just coming to another uh, Irish monastery on the continent. How does this come to St. Gallen? Do you know? um, I mean, the precise history of how it came here, uh, we don't know as yeah. it's often the case in early medieval times. But I mean, there is an Irish connection yeah. from St. Gallen to Ireland um, uh, through um, the founder of the hermit cell here yes. in St. Gallen, at St. Gaul, who yeah. is supposed to come from Ireland. And later on, we know from our monastery chronicles, um, the Casa Sancti Gallis, later on in the 9th century, Irish pilgrims on their we way to Rome from. would stop here and maybe brought books such as this one. This is fantastic. This is fantastic. Okay, come on. I know time is short. I know, and there, I mean, I could talk forever, but um, uh, one of the most interesting and maybe also most significant books, um, um, Irish books that we possess is this Christian, um, uh, this grammar by Christian. Um, it's a Latin grammar. It's a rather thick book, so yeah, yeah. it was a, a Latin grammar uh, for the advanced students and it was um, written in Ireland in the middle of the 9th century. And um, what is uh, important is that it's written in Irish minuscule, yes. so Irish script, and there are plenty of annotations, among which over 9,000 annotations, among which are over 3,000 glosses in Old Irish. So it's um, a crucial yes. witness to the old yes. English, um, uh, old Irish language, maybe one of the most important ones. That's amazing. Yes, I can see these little uh, annotations. Are, are these personal annotations um, from the scribes, or are they? Um, yeah, they, I mean, they are. They are often they explain. Uh, they refer to the text, but they are also personal annotations where the scribes. Um, um, complain about being tired yes, or their yeah. hands being cold and um, so yeah. that's maybe also what makes it so special and yeah. lively because they express their personal emotions. Yeah and put it down forever. Yes I have read that it is. <laughs> it shows that the Irish uh, in England when we mentioned the Irish uh, it is like almost like the Italians, you know, Shola Joie de Vivre. Uh, yes. Uh, <laughs> Blani, we call it, but it is uh, lovely um, to see that it is a national characteristic that goes back a millennia. And of course, it also um, uh, shows um, that um, at the time the Irish were very learned people. Yeah. They had a great interest into the Latin language, Latin grammar, which they had to learn from scratch. Yeah. Contrary yes. to partly Romanized yes. parts of Europe. Yes. And they also um, composed um, um, uh, special handbooks to learn yes. grammar. And is this, is this the Irish, the, is it Hesperica Feminine? Is this what this uh, language is or is this standard Latin? 
Uh, this is standard Latin right. because the Latin was composed in late antiquity. Right. Um, so it also shows the transmission originally Mediterranean works. They go all the way north, yes. are partly preserved and used and then come, come back, back with the Irish missionaries yeah. and the Irish learned man. That is wonderful. And uh, this I cannot leave unmentioned. It's four pieces put together. These um, yes. are fragments uh, preserving parts of Isidore of Seville's etymologies. And it's in Irish or in insular script yes. going back to the 7th century. Yeah. So it's one of the earliest um, yes. um, witnesses to insular script on parchment that is yes. preserved. And we find many characteristics of insular script already announced or on present this. in this. And this For, is within Gaul's lifetime. He is maybe 80 um, years old. Yeah, but I mean, then it, it must, so um, sure. I mean, it's Research. above all, it's very close to the life of Isidore of Seville, Seville yeah. who died in 638. Oh, he died in six, right, 638. Um, oh, yeah. So it might even have been written during his life yeah. or close to his uh, Then there is um, another book that shows us both and how learned the um, the Irish were, and also um, the impact they had on um, European culture. Um, it's this um, manuscript. Um, again, uh, this is a Bible, uh, the, um, the uh, Gospels, with an old Greek text, yeah. but also with um, a Latin interlinearly version. And it's supposed um, to have been written in Bobbio in the yes. second half of the ninth century. And um, what is so special about this is the fact that um, a, um, a whole book was written in Old Greek in yeah. the ninth century. Yes. And usually people did not it's actively yeah. know any more Old Greek. And for instance, here in St. Gallen at that time, we have only world lists, maybe small texts yes. written in Old Greek. And here we have a whole book. book and it's beautiful. Um, you see also the, the red and yeah, the yellow um, markings. There are actually two siblings to this book. Yes. I think one is in Dresden and one in Basel, I yeah. think. Um, uh, they have a similar makeup and we, we um, we also know that uh, the great Irish scholars of the ninth century, such as Sidulius Scotus yes. and so forth, um, they were among the very few who could still um, um, uh, know Old Greek um, and so forth. But we also see here that the book ha has never really been used yeah, so because no one... No, no, no um, marks on the edges. And, I mean, I read somewhere that and it's an, you know, an older source, said that if someone could speak Greek at this time, well, it, it was assumed that he was a Scot, uh, a Scot an, uh, Hibernian, uh, an Irishman. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, so they were. But this is from Bobbio in the 9th yes, century. Yes, and we, for instance, hear that the Latin script, again, is insular, yeah. uh, minuscule, and we also find some um, typical um, insular features uh, in the manuscript, like this, um, beginnings um, in form of a triangle where the letters yeah. um, 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 get smaller and smaller. Um, oh, it is very special. Oh, fantastic. Is there anything else? Um, you there, uh, I mean, for instance, um, also important, the Collectio Canonum Hibernensis, so a canon law collection. Um, and what does it say about the Irish tonsure here? Because there's some debate about I know it. it's very complicated. I tried to figure it out. I read a lot, but it's just not clear. What we do know is there was a Roman tonsure yeah. that was supposed to be the correct one already when the Collectio Canonum was written in the, in the um, I think it was composed in the 8th um, century, but here in a copy of at uh, the beginning of the 9th century. Yeah. And we know that the Irish tonsure was different. 
and uh, people have tried to reconstruct how exactly um, it looked. But what is interesting here, and that's typical for many texts of Irish origin, is the fact that they are not preserved in Irish script. Yes. Um, here it's a um, yeah. Carolingian yeah. uh, minuscule, and um, so it's one of the very many texts that came uh, with the Irish, or partly maybe later with the Anglo-Saxon missionaries yeah, yeah, in the 8th century right. uh, to the continent that were copied here in a familiar script, the Carolingian yeah. minuscule, and are still um, preserved. And um, right. it is a, an interesting book because usually canon law collection in the until the 9th or even 10th century we are composed in a chronological order and here we already have a thematic yes. um, organization so when it, for instance here it deals with uh, the tonsure they assemble all the canons they could find on this topic it is so interesting and, and here so that is one i mean we read bead he is almost apoplectic with rage that the Irish uh, have this different tonsure, but also the dating of Easter. And here is something that uh, Colin Barnes wrote to Gregory about, asking for further clarity. And, and actually, it's so amazing. We're seeing it written here in this manuscript, how to calculate the date of Easter using uh, what he, what Colin Barnes would say was the correct way. Mm, I mean, here it's not clear we we have hardly any real traces of the Irish way of calculating ah. Easter. But some very intelligent scholar have found uh, tiny little traces of it. Yes. And that was the only thing I could um, show. That is great. That is such an amazing treat. And it also shows, I mean, there were maybe three areas of learning where the Irish excel in the, in the um, um, 7th, 8th century, and that was the computus, so the art yeah. of calculating the correct uh, uh, or the, the date of Easter. It was grammar, as yes. we have talked, um, mentioned um, before, and um, uh, um, uh, biblical studies yes. and exegetical works. That's where they were uh, especially learned and good at. Yes, that's right. Yes. Um, well, is there one more thing you wanted to show us? Um, I have a man, this is a man who has a passion for manuscripts. I, I do. Um, um, I mean, here we have um, another Irish manuscript, beautifully illuminated, again, gospel here, just the gospel, gospel of St. John. Mm. Um, so we have now seen all four actually complete insular or Irish manuscript that we possess. Um, so the Gospel of St. John, the four Gospels, the Christian grammar, and... Um, it's this beautiful knot work. Um, oh, exactly, yeah. It. And you've got the dragons and... Oh. So we see here the beginning um, in Principio Erat Verbum. Yeah. And um, uh, so these double pages, yeah. um, richly illuminated and with this um, very peculiar insular yeah, art. Yeah. In the um, beginning was the uh, it, uh, yeah. and some of those patterns of medallions and spiral motifs. And I haven't got the date for this. Oh, oh 800, this so is the time of Charlemagne's accession. Around 800. And as so often, we are not sure whether it was written and illuminated on the continent by Irish scribes yeah. or in Ireland. Yeah, that's amazing. Yes, I had uh, one one source saying, it seems that the Irish have come all together. No, um, or how did he put it? It was very funny. But it was as if there was a mass migration of the Irish scholars coming to the continent. Um, that is an interesting phenomenon. I mean, why exactly did they come? Uh, I mean, of course, uh, it was religion, um, but still, you have to do it, and in such great numbers. Yeah. And I mean, you have the first wave in the uh, in the seventh century, like the missionaries, and then in the ninth century, you have the scholars, yeah. um, and both leaving a huge 
impact. Yeah, yes, it is extraordinary. I can see the beginning with Columbanus, and I can see in their thinking to be um, Peregrinatio Pro Cristo, to uh, this exile mm. ever, to be like, I don't know, um, like a biblical prophet, or, you know, like John the Baptist in the desert. But it, for another, another time. Thank you. Yes. Thank you so much. Okay. It's so big, much nice. Yeah, yeah. Philip, thank, thank you. you. It's all laid out here. It is. Next time on Saving Europe, we follow Columbanus across the Alps into Italy. Yeah, the way that Columbanus came, it's a beautiful plateau. We will sniff out almost forgotten locations associated with Columbanus and finally arrive in Lombardy to meet another remarkable Dark Age queen. A very extraordinary woman called Theodolinda. Where it turns out that Columbanus has something she needs. So, at the cathedral she built, We'll also sample Colin Barnes' literary legacy before heading further south. All this and more next time on Saving Europe. Remember also that this journey was part of the research for a book which uses the lives of Colin Barnes and Schumann to explore the unlikely arrival, survival, victory and atrophy of European civilization. Do follow the links below to find out more. Please let us know what you thought of this episode, what you liked, what you didn't, what was new to you? Just start a conversation below in the comments section. And of course, if you found the content helpful, then we're pretty sure you're going to like this next one suggested here. But also, while you're there, don't forget to help us by subscribing to the channel. Thanks for watching.